Okay, it's seven o'clock, so we will get started. Um, today, we will be having the last uh, webinar of our series of webinars we've done with Mary Jo Gibson, Penn State Master Gardener for Columbia County at a Penn State Extension. Today, the topic is gonna be spotted lanternfly, uh, different myths and how to control those in your backyard. So without further ado, Mary Jo, take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, I give thanks to Columbia County Conservation District for hosting these presentations. I am Mary Jo Gibson. I've been a Penn State Extension Master Gardener of Columbia County since 2003. And even though we're speaking about spotted lanternfly this evening, I have always technical, had diff technical difficulties. There we go. I've always liked bugs. Yes, that really is me. A very, very long time ago, my father was a beekeeper. Now, this is Lymantria dispar. It's a caterpillar. And if you take a deep breath, you can realize that really is not an ugly insect. Uh, it does have great big beady eyes, but those uh, paired blue and red dots are really kind of pretty. Uh, Lymantria is going to have a new name. The American Entomological Society is changing its common name, so it's less derogatory to some groups. This is the emerald ash borer. And this was accidentally introduced into Michigan in 2002, probably in shipping wood or in a pallet. And that's about 19 years ago. And the next time we have a decent storm, uh, there is going to be a great big dead ash tree falling over the path to my compost pile. Uh, it's been dead now for or dying close to 10 years. And all the other ashes in the neighborhood have also died. Uh, I've watched the birds get the bugs out of it. The bark has loosened. And just a few days ago, I noticed that it is no longer standing upright. It is leaning. So even the roots are doing a good job of decomposing. And with the next storm, it'll be down. This is Lycorma delicutata. Uh, this is the insect of today's presentation. It is a very pretty insect from my point of view. It is not a moth. Uh, initially, when it was first discovered, they spread its wings and a lot of people thought it was some kind of moth or butterfly. It isn't. However, everything depends on your point of view. So let's look at this insect from a different perspective. Aha. From this perspective, it looks positively sinister. By the way, those are not beady red eyes. Those are antennae. The eyes are black and they're kind of tricky to see in this photo. So this evening we'll be talking about a new invasive pest, the spotted lanternfly. And as it continues to spread throughout Pennsylvania and some of our nearby states, we're going to need a lot more education out there uh, so that the public understands what's going on. And with everything else, knowledge really is power. Okay, this evening's program is pretty much divided into four sections identification feeding, hosts, and management. So let's get started. The spotted lanternfly is native to Asia, and it was first discovered in Pennsylvania in Berks County in 2014. The Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture entomologists estimated that it had probably been here since 2012 based on the weathered condition of the egg masses that were found. It's unsure exactly how it got here. Uh, it may have come in on a pallet of stones from Asia. This insect was accidentally introduced into the Korean Peninsula in 2004 and into Japan in 2009. Now, 
as of last week, it is found in 10 states. This is its current distribution. This map was updated by the Northeastern IPM Center on July 26th. So this map is brand new. Uh, let's see if I can get my marker doing its thing here. Okay, here we have Pennsylvania and nothing has changed in New York State. Uh, this section of New York, Staten Island here, uh, this little section here in Connecticut remains the same. Just about all of New Jersey is under quarantine, which means when an area is quarantined, and we will be talking about that, it has to do with moving materials into and out of the area. And I was looking and looking and looking and wondering what was going on. And then I saw it. Indiana is now a brand new state with an, a population of spotted lanternflies. This little blue dot down here is Switzerland County and it is right on the Ohio River. And over here we have Illinois and this is all the Ohio River, the southern border of Indiana and Ohio and right up to here. Here is a county in Ohio with a population of spotted lanternfly and it just hopped right across the border from Western Pennsylvania. And we will be talking more about this, but it seems that the spotted lantern fly really is a very good hitchhiker. It follows transportation lines, whether it's interstates, whether it's railroads, and now it's following transportation on the river because this part of the Ohio River really is a shipping lane. It's not just a pretty river. Our Susquehanna here is not navigable, but the Ohio River is. So here's Pennsylvania. Up until uh, this spring, usually the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is the one that re uh, they revised their quarantine maps in the spring after they have gotten out in the winter and hunted for egg masses. Egg masses is one way to determine that there is an established population. Last year, all the quarantine counties were in purple. Uh, this year, the blue areas have been added, and here we are right up in Columbia County with the red star. Now, the quarantine goes by county. Okay, So when you're looking at these counties, it doesn't necessarily mean that the insects population is completely throughout that county. The darker blue areas represent the area where there is a known population of spotted lantern flies. So up here, Montour County was added this year. That's Mahoning Township. Uh, last year in Columbia County, C Centralia and Cunningham Township were added. Northumberland County, it was the Mount Carmel and Culpmont area. In Luzerne County, it was a very divided area. It was Denison Township, which is out by Whitehaven and Interstate 80, and Hanover Township, which is adjacent to Wilkesbury along the Susquehanna River. But here we have the spotted lanternfly working its way westerly across the state, following the interstate, following the railroads. So what does this guy look like? Well, again, if you like bugs, and I do, and for once I can call insects bugs and nobody's going to be grumpy with me. Um, the life cycle of spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania is only one generation per year. Uh, here is the overwintering stage. The eggs are laid, and we'll go into detail on this. Usually in the fall. They overwinter as an egg mass, and sometime usually in May, depending where you are within the state, and depending on the temperatures, uh, these cute little black with white speckled nymphs will appear. Uh, they go through three molts, and then we have another nymphal stage that's red, still has black trim with white dots. And right about now, uh, it is August, uh, and in southern parts of Pennsylvania, there are 
uh, a good number of adult spotted lantern flies. And this is what it looks like as it's resting. And once in a while, if it's startled or if it is about to fly, it will naturally spread its wings and you can see the red underwing on it. There are only three stages to the life cycle of the spotted lantern fly, the egg, nymphs, and adult. It's called incomplete metamorphosis. There is no caterpillar or larval stage, and there is no cocoon. Uh, that's common in moths and butterflies. This isn't a moth or a butterfly. It is a true bug. Let's look at these stages a little bit more closely. Okay. The first, second, and third instars are pretty much alike, just a little bit bigger with each one. These are really, really strong jumpers, and they will jump away when, you're appro when they're approached or prodded. The first one I ever met, um, a friend was about to squish it, and I said, wait a minute. And as I got my finger close to it, it hopped, and it hopped so far, so fast, that we actually didn't know where it went. Now, when these guys first hatch, they're very small. They're about an eighth of an inch, but they're going to grow to about a quarter of an inch. So you can think about them as easily fitting on your pinky fingernail. Um, in May at the election polls in Luzerne County, someone told me that they saw an adult. That's absolutely impossible. Um, a friend who told me said they saw the squish carcass and they said the wings were gray but didn't see any spots and I said there are no adults, no living adults in Pennsylvania in May. So it was just some poor critter that got squished. Now, when these guys are little, their beak, and we'll talk about their beaks in a moment, uh, are small. They're not exceptionally strong. So these insects feed on small stems. They feed on what are called herbaceous plants, soft plants, not uh, plants that get hard. The fourth instar is bright red. These are actually more noticeable. The others really do tend to blend in, uh, but these are more noticeable and they're also bigger. These are larger. These are a good half an inch long. So these would completely cover your pinky fingers, fingernails, okay? Now, there are a lot of lookalikes, and this is where a lot of people get confused with them. Uh, when the nymphs first hatch, they're about the size and the same general shape as a tick, okay? As they grow a little bit, they're often confused with a brown marmorated stink bug uh, because stink bugs start out life small, like all everybody does, and they just might not know what that is. There are some milkweed bugs that are out there right now. A lot of the milkweed bugs are adults, but there are some that are still in the nymph stages like this. And he, yes, it's a milkweed bug, but it's, it's on a rudbeckia. And, you know, they're just kind of hanging out there, but they really do their feeding mostly on milkweeds. And then there's the box elder bug. Okay. Just another insect that many people don't pay attention to. To me, none of these look anything like a spotted lantern fly or adult or a nymph, but not everybody looks at insects the way I do. One way to figure out what it is, is poke it. And if it jumps enthusiastically, uh, you're probably looking at a spotted lantern fly. Okay, now I think this is such a cool picture because this is the molting process. This is the fourth instar. So uh, it's a little tough to see the red on it, but it's the red with black and still has the white spots. It has split down its back, it's called ecdysis, and the adult is emerging from it. And yeah, it's pink. It, the pigment will darken on it, but initially it is very light colored and it is also very vulnerable. 
but it's going to firm up and darken up in just uh, a matter of, well, let's say hours. Okay, so this is the adult. These are exceptionally strong hoppers. These guys can fly. They're not particularly good flyers. Uh, and they have some skills that are, I hope, going to get them in trouble. But they uh, are kind of clumsy flyers. But they do fly. They're really good at glider. And at each stage, as the nymph get bigger and bigger, and at the last molt, they become an adult, each time the beak, their feeding mechanism, gets longer and stronger. And when these guys emerge from a fourth instar nymph, usually in July, and so it's pretty much happening now, uh, in our area, there aren't, thank goodness, too many uh, spotted lantern flies yet, but there are some populations of them around. And uh, you're going to find an overlap. You'll find both the red polka dotted ones and the adults. But they're going to start feeding on firmer and firmer plant material. And so you're likely to find adults on trees and they're going, their beak is strong enough to go th right through the bark and they're actually feeding on phloem. Those phloem is uh, the plumbing inside the tree and phloem, uh, food flows through phloem as my 10th grade biology teacher reminded us. Uh, and so the phloem plumbing goes from the leaves where photosynthesis takes place, down through the leaf stem, the petiole, down through the branches and down the trunk to ultimately nourish the living cells that are down in the roots. Okay. Um, can spotted lantern flies kill trees. Sometimes, usually not. Uh, I had a client tell me that last year the spotted lantern fly killed his maple in Shikshini. Uh, in 2019-2020 it had two dead branches and this year it was all dead and it was a big tree. I said I don't think so. He admitted he never saw any spotted lantern flies, but they must have killed his tree because nothing else could have. Well, it could have been any number of other issues, uh, but it certainly wasn't spotted lantern flies because if there were spotted lantern flies on his maple tree, he surely would have seen them. And unless the tree is really being stressed by something else, they're not likely to kill it. And often when the adults feed, they're going to be feeding in an area where there is the branch and trunk union. It has to do with the way trees are put together internally. So what about lookalikes for the adults? Well, there are a bunch of them. And in a couple moments, I'll have some pictures and it'll be like a quiz for you. Now, this insect over here, this actually is a moth. This is the Ailanthus webworm moth. And it actually rests with its wings all folded. Um, this is a really neat insect. It's actually originally a tropical insect. Uh, when it flies, it looks kind of waspish. So, you know, a lot of predators will stay away from it. And it looks more like a beetle a narrow beetle when it's at rest. Uh, this insect actually follows the Ailanthus, the tree of heaven, uh, all throughout the United States. It is a tro originally a tropical insect, and uh, it was down in Florida, and now it is spreading out throughout the United States. This is a really pretty in insect. This is a virgin tiger moth. Um, it's sort of a, a cousin to woolly bears, caterpillars, we'll say it that way. It's not exactly, but it's similar. And this is a really good one to get confused because the underwings have that kind of an orangey blush to them. And if you don't know what spotted lantern flies look like, but you've kind of heard some things, this is a, a good look alike. And then there's a giant leopard moth. 
again, it's not a spotted lanternfly. It is a true moth, but some of the wing markings are a little bit similar. Now, spotted lanternfly egg masses are what we are most likely to find when we're hunting for spotted lanternfly populations. And spotted lanternflies will lay them on absolutely positively any surface. Uh, vines, tree trunks, posts, stones, lawn furniture. I have a couple pictures in a moment. They're late in the fall, they overwinter, and they hatch in our late spring. In Pennsylvania, the average number of eggs per egg mass is 35 to 40. Okay, so is there something about that that we can use to help manage spotted lanternflies? Sure there is. Because spotted lanternflies will often lay their eggs in sheltered locations. Okay, here we have a, uh, a metal post. Okay, here are lots of egg masses on a tree. We can go hunting for them and we can scrape them off. And let's say if there are 40 eggs per mass and there are 30 masses on the tree, that's more than a thousand eggs that we are able to remove. But please do not just scrape them off. Let's do it the right way. And while you're looking, look in all kinds of places, uh, light bulbs, old tires, even soft furniture, outdoor furniture cushions, the underside of a planting box. Here's a camp chair that was just leaning against a tree at the wrong time, and now it has egg masses on it. But are they all egg masses of spotted lanternflies? Well, maybe not. Okay. The spotted lanternfly egg mass is covered with kind of a gray putty. Okay. Gypsy moth egg masses, like this one down here, are kind of beige colored, a beige to tan. And they have uh, actual fuzz in them. And the fuzz is there because the female uh, gypsy moth actually puts some of the scales from her body on the egg mass to protect it. Now, what I'm getting a lot of questions about these days are lichens. Lichens are totally harmless growths that occur well, on rocks, but people notice them more on tree trunks and tree branches. It's a really cool symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi. Uh, they're kind of a light gray green. Uh, if you look at them carefully, there's a, kind of a little bit of a leafy look to them. They don't hurt the tree, they don't hurt the bark, and they're not going to hatch into anything. Okay. We have four pictures here that friends or relatives of mine took and sent to me, okay? Which one or ones of these are spotted lanternflies? Well, this one is a spotted lanternfly. This was down uh, in Hamburg, Pennsylvania at Cabela's parking lot. It got stopped. And this one over here is also a spotted lantern fly from down in the Lehigh Valley last year. This one is from Mifflinville. It was on a church door and it came into the Master Gardener hotline. Is this a spotted lantern fly? And before we had a chance to respond, the client emailed back and said, I'm pretty sure it's a giant leopard moth. And it was indeed. But this is a really good view. Uh, it's a lot different in size. And if you look at it from the opposite direction, the, the shape is different. But that's a, a really good question. And this is a net winged beetle. This was at a soccer match down, I think it was toward Lehigh Valley in 2019. And uh, is this a spotted lantern fly? So get the word out there. Uh, the more questions there are, the more you're going to learn. Okay, so what do these guys eat? Well, I showed you a picture already of maple trees, and there were a couple other photos there of the little guys. Okay, 
Well, let's back up a little bit and look at just who these insects are first. These are insects in the order Hemiptera, which means they are true bugs. And that means that they are distant, and let's underline the word distant cousins of cicadas. And this is the annual cicada that's singing outdoors right now. Okay, a friend calls them the back to school bugs. They are cousins to distant cousins again, aphids. They are cousins to this beautiful candy striped leaf hopper, also called a red banded leaf hopper. And then we have a cousin here, the brown marmorated stink bug. And each of these hemipterans has a triangular shaped scutellum on its back. Okay, that is the characteristic, among other things, that makes these different from a lot of other insects. It's easy to separate them from beetles, for example. Just look for that triangular space on the back. And even if I take away that triangle, you can still see it in the image. Okay. Now, within the order Hemiptera is the family Fulgurity. And these are the plant hoppers. These are closer relatives of the spotted lantern fly. Most of them are tropical and they're really colorful and they don't cause any trouble. <clears throat> And in its native land, the spotted lanternfly is not a pest at all. It has natural predators and diseases that prevent overpopulation. So in its native land, it is not well studied at all because it's just another insect out there. It doesn't cause any problems, so nobody pays any attention to it. Okay, so let's talk about feeding method. All hemipterans, whether it's a little bitty green aphid or a large annual cicada, they all have a piercing sucking mouth part between these two ends of the blue lines. And they feed on plant sap through that. What we've learned about the spotted lantern fly is it has a piercing mouth part. It actually doesn't suck the sap up at all it relies on the turgor pressure of the plant, the natural pressure that's within the plumbing to push the sap into the insect. And as it's feeding, it is also excreting what we fondly call honeydew, which is really sugar water. Um, most of the hemipterans are not very good at processing the sap that they're feeding on, and the spotted lantern fly might be the worst offender in that case. It just poops out a whole lot of excrement and it is called honeydew and it really is sugar water. And the fact that it's sugar water causes additional issues beyond just its feeding. Now, this is a video, if you look carefully, you can see the insects moving around. And up in this section, you can see carefully if you're peeking, depending on the size of the device that you're watching the webinar here, you can see little somethings spraying out of the insects. That is honeydew. And as you're looking at this, please notice it's a grapevine and there are clusters of grapes there. Notice, the spotted lantern flies aren't on the fruit. Spotted lantern flies don't feed on fruit. They feed on stems and branches, unlike their distant cousin, the brown marmorated stink bug, which feeds on fruit, okay? So this video is showing you how these creatures are attaching and how they're excreting the honeydew. So what's the next step with the honeydew? Well, they might not be on the grapes, but there could be a cluster of grapes above or a cluster of grapes below. And there definitely are leaves all surrounding the grapes. And where this honeydew lands, remember it's sugar water, where the honeydew lands, 
it is actually going to grow what's called sooty mold. Okay. And that's going to interfere with photosynthesis. So this insect really is kind of like a double whammy for the plants. Not only is it feeding on the plant sap and where it lets go, that wound is going to ooze a little bit, but it's also excreting a lot of sugar water that's going to turn into city mold that's going to hamper photosynthesis. So we have photosynthesis being impaired and we have sap being removed from a plant. So it is really tough on plants. It also is pretty tough on your backyard. Okay, uh, here's a set of steps in an area down near Berks County where there were a lot of spotted lantern flies feeding on a tree over the, uh, over the deck. And so they were excreting honeydew that was landing on the steps and the bottom step was power washed, okay? The upper steps were not. And yeah, it is sticky. It is not particularly slippery unless it's raining and then it really can be slippery, but it's something that you're going to have to clean things up. Whatever you do, do not power wash tree trunks. Uh, the sooty mold is going to be uh, a cosmetic issue on a tree trunk, but don't power wash it off because then you're going to end up removing tree trunk and that is the protective coating for plants. So I've been talking about plants and one thing I said was a maple and you saw a picture of the grapes. What other host plants do spotted lanternflies feed on? Well, uh, about two years ago, we knew that there were over 70 species of plants here in North America. Again, remember, this insect is brand new to our habitat. It doesn't know what it likes and what it doesn't like. It just goes around sampling things. We don't know what it likes and what it doesn't like because all the continents have their own habitat, their own kinds of plants. What we have learned is that there are now over 103 species, uh, which makes it a really broad range of hosts. What we know is that there is not substantial feeding on conifers. So the pines and the spruces and their friends that have cones, uh, there's not substantial feeding on those. It could be because the sap is too sticky. We don't know the reason, we just know that they rarely feed on conifers. But we do know what they do like. They like tree of heaven, which is an old friend from the old country, okay? Tree of heaven is Ilanthus altissima. It's an introduced species into North America. It was purposely brought here as a street tree, as a shade tree uh, from Asia. And they just welcome it like an old friend. They also like grapes and they feed on grapes in just about every stage of their life cycle. We have learned that they like our black walnuts. They especially like red and silver maples. Okay? That doesn't mean they don't like other maples. They just really like silver and red. But one of the questions is, what about when you go up into New England and parts of New York State, where the main maple up there are the sugar maples used to make maple syrup? And there might not be so many silver and reds. Well, we hope that we'll find some ways to manage a spotted lanternfly before they get into those areas. But um, we're will pretty willing to bet that they will like sugar maples too. They like our river birches, they like willows, they like all the kinds of sumacs and about a hundred more that we know of for sure. Now, you may have heard that spotted lanternflies kill trees. Well, they don't. Spotted lanternfly is a plant stressor. 
and the spotted lanternfly has not been observed to kill plants. Okay, it doesn't kill plants except, you know, there's always the exception. It may kill tree of heaven. It doesn't always, but it may. If you have a very tasty small tree sapling, it's possible that if there are a lot of spotted lantern flies on it, it may end up dying. Okay. And unfortunately, grapevines are one of the favorite foods and it can kill grapevines, particularly some of the wine varieties of grapes. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more. Now, what does a plant stressor really mean? It means that the plant may have an increased susceptibility to diseases or unfavorable weather conditions, which could then cause reduced growth, died back, and possibly even death, okay? By itself, a spotted lanternfly is not likely to cause the death of a tree or a plant. It's unlikely to do that. So if you think the spotted lanternflies are going to come in and kill everything on your property, it's not going to happen. Just take a deep breath, realize that's not going to happen. Uh, as a gardener, I push habitat sometimes for trees. If it likes shade or partial shade and I put it in the sun, I'm not going to expect that plant to do very well. And if some other stressor comes along, then that plant is probably not going to survive, okay? You have to put the right plant in the right place. And if you do that, then even spotted lanternfly won't kill the plant. Okay, now, so far, grapes are the only agricultural commodity that has seriously reduced yields and dead vines. Okay. Um, spotted lanternflies also like hops. Okay. So there's the beer industry. And now we're still going to talk about the wine industry. But what you need to understand is how grape vines are pruned for grape production. The vines are specially pruned because grapes are born, the flowers. Yeah, there really are flowers on grapes. But the grape flowers and then the grape fruit are born on one year old growth. So what you end up with in a vineyard are really sturdy stalks or trunks and then a lot of young branches. And if you think about it, that means the grape vines are absolutely tasty to all stages of spotted lanternfly. The first, second, third, fourth in star nymphs and the adults. It's just wonderful. Okay. Here we have an apple tree. Okay. Notice again, the spotted lantern flies are on the trunk, on the branches. They are not on the fruit. Unfortunately, the honeydew is going to land on the fruit. And if it's an apple, it can be washed off. Uh, for some reason, they're um, sometimes given a choice, okay, given choices. Spotted lantern flies are not too keen on peaches, but if there aren't a whole lot of other plants that they do like better, then on a peach tree, they're going to feed and they're going to get the honeydew on the peaches and it's going to grow sooty mold in a nice, soft, fuzzy peach. There's no way the grower can get that off. Let's look at something closer to home, okay? We have peppers and blueberries and cucumbers and even a hibiscus flower. These plants are going to wilt when the turgor pressure decreases because of spotted lantern flies sucking out so much sap. However, remember spotted lantern flies don't truly suck out the sap. It's just pushed into their mouth by turgor pressure. So when the turgor pressure drops down, 
and the plant starts to wilt, the spotted lanternfly is going to go somewhere else to feed. And then can we, the gardener, fix it? Sure we can. How? By irrigation. Okay. Is it going to stress the plant? Yes. Might the yields be reduced a little bit? Yes. Is it going to kill the plant? Probably not. Okay. Okay. Now, in the backyards, there are some other issues. Okay, here we have a, a, a birch tree and we have those really pretty, you have to admit they're pretty, uh, fourth instar red and white and black nymphs there. But, okay, here we have the spotted lantern fly up here feeding, it's giving off honeydew and the honeydew is going to attract opportunists, okay? Uh, like yellow jackets, okay? They're going to be attracted to the sweet honeydew. And so attracting a stinging insect is not the best thing in a residential area. Okay. So phenology. Phenology is great. Phenology is a study of the timing of events, biological events in plants and animals, such as when a particular plant flowers, when a particular animal goes into hibernation, when it reproduces, when they migrate, okay? And this is all in relation to changes in season and climate. There's a way cool website called budburst.org. It's a citizen science program. When the spotted lanternfly is picking its hosts, it seems to be dependent on two things proximity and seasonality. How close is something, okay? Because remember, initially these guys just hop, so close is good. And what time of the year is it? Um, let's look at the chart here a little bit. In May and June, okay, roses are really yummy. It doesn't matter if it's the, your beautiful hybrid rose or if it's the wild invasive multiflora rose, it's tasty for little nymphs. Then it doesn't seem to be a problem anymore. Okay. Grapes are tasty at all times to all life stages, as is the tree of heaven. Okay. But if we look at some other things like black walnuts and their cousins, their close cousins, the butternuts, okay, they're too tough for the little nymphs, but they're really good for the larger nymphs, but then the adults seem to prefer to go somewhere else. If we're looking at river birches and willows and sumacs, they aren't a suitable host for the little guys, they're okay for the larger nymphs in July and of course all the adults. And so then if we're going into the maples, they're the best food for the adults, okay? So again, it has to do with what's close by proximity and also the seasonality of these things. So how are we gonna manage these guys? Okay, take a deep breath. I've told you they're not going to kill your plants. Are they going to be inconvenient? Oh yeah, but they're not going to kill your plants. So how can we manage them? First thing we can do is stop the spread, okay? We can also scrape and smash eggs. We can use traps on trees, and there's a new one called a circle trap that works well. We can remove tree of heaven, and there's a way you must do that, and there is already a video on the Conservation District website for how to remove tree of heaven. There's also a resource paper there, and all you have to do is click on the links, and you can find lots of information about the right way to remove tree of heaven. And the last choice is applying insecticides. And you can't simply grab a bottle of kills them all and have success with that. Okay. So 
stop the spread. Don't move firewood. That was an issue with emerald ash borer. People were moving firewood. It simply moved the emerald ash borer really fast. The same thing can happen now with spotted lanternfly because of the egg masses on the wood, okay? Always check any outdoor equipment before you move it. And this might sound kind of funny. Don't park under infested trees. Well, you're going to have a mess to clean. You're going to spend a lot of time with your car in a car wash if you do. But keep your windows rolled up. Uh, I was out in Center County for the last couple of days. And I automatically put my windows down just a little bit when I was parking in the sun. And then I went, uh-oh. But no, they don't have spotted lantern flies in the area where I was. So that was okay for me to not have my windows rolled up all the way. Now, Penn State and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture are going, putting up signs and posters um, to call people's attention to this insect, to have them start looking for things. Uh, I stopped one time at a, uh, a trucking place and there was an entire bulletin board. It was really very, very well done. Uh, teaching the drivers what to look for. Okay, so what can you do with the eggs? Don't simply scrape the eggs onto the ground. They'll hatch from the ground, okay? And the same thing is with uh, gypsy moth egg masses too. Scrape the eggs into a bottle or a bag. You can submerge them in alcohol. Uh, you can smash them with a the hard surface. You actually can hear the eggs bursting. It's kind of like bubble wrap. Uh, and if you want to, you can bury the eggs, okay? It, they probably would hatch underground, but they certainly aren't going to be able to crawl their way up and out of the ground. Um, you could burn them, okay? But you don't simply scrape the eggs onto the ground because, yes, they really will hatch there. Now, anytime we're talking about sticky bands, Sticky bands are no longer recommended at all because of all the bycatch that was happening. This is a, a sticky band wrapped around a tree trunk and it was covered. It's very hard to see in the photo because the chicken wire, the hex mesh, absolutely visually disappears. But the problem is that wasn't enough to stop the bycatch of butterflies or birds or even chipmunks, okay? All sorts of things were getting caught in the, sticky, in the sticky bands. So that is no longer a recommended way of doing things. Uh, the idea is that the nymphs either get blown out of the treetops, out of the canopy, or they jump off the leaves and then they just walk over to the nearest vertical surface and climb their way up again and they get stuck in the sticky bands. Uh, but there are way, way, way too many uh, non-target animals that are getting caught. Instead, you can put like uh, window screening, like a skirt around the sticky bands. The sticky bands will still trap the nymphs as they crawl up the tree trunk, but you're not going to get the bycatch that way. There's a new thing called a circle trap. Again, you have a skirt of window mesh, window screening going around the tree trunk, at least part way, and then it goes up into a funnel and up into either a jar or a plastic bag, and the jar or the plastic bag would be emptied every couple of days. It is using their natural ability to go up the trunks uh, to trap them. And this actually also works with adults. I mentioned that the adult spotted lantern flies are not particularly good flyers, but they're good gliders. They seem to have an innate sense to crawl up a vertical surface, crawl up a side of a building, crawl up a telephone pole, and then they launch themselves off 
uh, flapping and gliding as much as they can to get as far as they can. They tend to do that uh, as adults, especially toward late August. Okay, uh, it's a dispersal. We don't know for sure why they disperse, but we've observed that they do disperse. Okay, I mentioned earlier that Tree of Heaven is a management technique. The Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is proposing this. Now, you, the, their idea is that if you remove Tree of Heaven, some of it, it will reduce the spotted lanternfly population. You can either trap it on the remaining trees or you can kill the spotted lanternfly on the remaining trees. Tree of heaven, you can't just cut it down. If you simply cut down a tree of heaven, it comes back with a vengeance. The stump will sprout, the roots will sprout. You say, well, I'll just spray the cut stump with concentrated herbicide and that will keep the trunk from sprouting. It will, but the roots will sprout. So you have to treat it with herbicide at just the right time. And right now is just the right time. So two weeks ago, I did a presentation on how to manage tree of heaven. Uh, it's on the... Columbia County Conservation District website, and so is a resources sheet. Uh, this is Penn State's information sheet on it, and at the end of this presentation, I'll show you the easy way to get that. Tree of Heaven uh, can be a large tree. They can also be small, because everybody starts out life small. They have very long, long, long pinnately compound leaves, their leaflets have a smooth margin and at the base of each leaflet is a little, I somehow started calling them ears when I was a child, uh, but they have these little notches at the base of the leaflets. And the, one of the really accurate ways of identifying tree of heaven is that it stinks. Uh, I've been told it smells like cat urine. I don't think it smells like cat urine. That smells too good. This smells like rotten, rancid peanut butter. It's nasty. Tree of Heaven comes in separate male and female trees. Right now, the female trees have seeds. Most of them are kind of a, well, two weeks ago, they were kind of chartreuse green. Some of them were turning tan and getting the little bit of red blush to them. Uh, this week, when I saw them along the interstate, they were really pretty. Like I said, a nice tan with a red blush. The bark of uh, Tree of Heaven looks to me like cantaloupe skin. Again, you can't just cut down Tree of Heaven. You have to treat it with a herbicide at the right time of the year, which happens to be late July, August, September, and possibly early October. Okay, let's have a quiz. Is this tree of heaven? Does this bark look like cantaloupe skin? Do, are there little ears at the base of these leaflets? Does this look like a little papery seed? Nope, this is our native black walnut. Is this tree of heaven? The branches are kind of fuzzy. We have the whitish green flowers that will become a fuzzy red cluster. And here we have finely toothed leaflets. Nope, this is staghorn sumac. How about this one? Is this tree of heaven? Does this look like cantaloupe skin? Are there really big leaf scars? Let me tell you. These guys have really strong attachments for their leaves to the branches. Smooth skin on the leaf, on the branches. Here we have little ears at the base. Yes. This is our tree of heaven, okay? You shouldn't try to manage something if you can't identify it accurately. 
So we're talking about an insect. You have lots of insecticide choices. Please do not, no, 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 a thousand times no. Don't use any kind of homemade remedy. If you're out to save a plant, you're probably going to end up damaging the plant or yourself or your children or your pets. Uh, please don't do that. Please do take into consideration the beneficial insects that are out in your yard. No homemade remedies, please. It's very, very dangerous to do that. So what should you use? Okay. Um, Penn State Extension has a great website with lots and lots of information. There's a new fact sheet. The very first thing they say is avoid overreacting. Okay. They're not going to kill your plants. They really aren't. And is the, this product that you want to use, is it registered? Okay. There's a brand new document out there called Spotted Lanternfly Management for Residents. Please do read that. And take into consideration, please, okay? Read the resident's guide. Think about which option is going to work for you. Some really important things to consider. What kind of plants are you trying to protect? Is it really necessary to protect them, okay? Do you see lots of spotted lantern flies or are there just a few? By the way, fly swatters work really well. Do you actually see any spotted lantern fly damage on your plants or trees? In many cases, you're not going to. And keep this in mind, there are a lot of really good insects out there. Do you have a lot of bees and other insects or maybe your neighbors do? Or maybe somebody's growing a crop that needs to be pollinated by beneficial insects. That if you get out there and start spraying insecticides, it's not going to work. Okay, it's going to damage the good guys. Okay, we also have charts. Okay, this tells you the. Um, mode of exposure, okay, how it's going to work, okay, and this will tell you, is it going to work well on spotted lantern flies, or is it not going to work well on spotted lantern flies, and is this chemical going to hang around for a while, or is it going to lose its effectiveness in a day? There are reasons to have things break down in a day or two, and there are some products that maybe, depending if you're using them the right way, having them active for several days is the way to go. Okay, take time to read and think about how you're doing this. So, what is the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and what is the United States Department of Agriculture doing? They are identifying high priority sites and they're targeting the highest population of spotted lantern flies. Um, this year, they were able to get permission and they are spraying an insecticide along railroad rights of way to help slow the spread. Again, these insects are extremely good hitchhikers. And one of the ways that they can help slow down the spread is by spraying some broad spectrum insecticides. What else are we doing? Well, I'm going to give you the high speed version of Tree of Heaven Trap Trees, okay? There's a free webinar from last summer that you can watch on extension. Again, there is a webinar that I uh, did two weeks ago and there's a resources sheet. So all you have to do is click on the links in the resources sheet and this is listed there. Now, this is where I ask you to pay attention to what I'm saying, because pesticides kill pests. There are different kinds of pesticides. There are pesticides that kill mice and rats, rodenticides. There are pesticides that kill plants. They're herbicides. There are pesticides that kill insects, they're insecticides, OK? 
okay? There are molluscicides, pesticides that kill snails and slugs, okay? So take care to listen to what kind of pesticide I'm saying for the next couple slides and how I'm using it. Okay, to create a trap tree using Tree of Heaven, identify and kill most of the Tree of Heaven trees with a herbicide. Okay, herbicides kill plants, especially the female trees. Why are we killing off the female trees? Because they have this gigantic seed set on them. Okay. So we're going to kill off most of them. We're going to keep a couple around, okay? Spotted lanternflies are sap feeders. They only feed on live trees. So we're gonna keep a couple alive. You don't have to cut down the other ones. You can actually let them stand there if they're not gonna fall on any, anything important, okay? You treat the living trees with a systemic insecticide, okay? Systemic means it goes throughout the whole plant. The spotted lantern flies feed on the living insecticide treated tree of heaven, and then the spotted lantern flies die, dead and it really does work. Okay. The insecticides that are systemic that are used are dinotrofuran and imidacloprid. Uh, dinotrofuran is the one that has been mostly studied because it's very water soluble. It moves quickly throughout a tree and it has a short act, uh, residual activity time. So it doesn't last forever, okay? It's short-lived, but it moves fast. Imidacloprid moves more slowly, but it lasts longer, uh, which means it might be an issue when flowers bloom. Okay, what about natural predators? Well, most, not all, but most of the mantids, the praying mantises that you find are actually Chinese mantids. Okay, they were brought here to manage insect pests, but they're generalist predators. They'll eat whatever they can catch. And so they're old friends with the spotted lanternfly. And they're not going to control it, but they're going to have a couple of really tasty snacks. We do have some predatory stink bugs. Not all stink bugs are bad. We have some predatory ones and they're going to feed. And then we have our friends, the spiders, and spiders are pretty opportunistic, but none of these is going to do a good job of controlling the population. So what we did is we sent researchers to Asia to learn about the natural predators of spotted lanternfly. These insects are creatures that keep the spotted lanternfly population from becoming pests. They just grew up with them, they live together feeding on each other actually, okay? And we found two parasitoid species, uh, parasitoids are actually better than parasites. A uh, successful parasite doesn't kill its host. Uh, parasitoid always kills its host. So the researchers went to China, they gathered two different parasitoid species of itty bitty teeny tiny wasps. These are wasps that are about the size of a gnat. They couldn't sting us humans even if they wanted to. And uh, these are basically egg parasitoids and they are currently being studied in a secure quarantine facility here in the United States. Uh, it's kind of cool. We found that these are similar to another itty bitty teeny tiny wasp that was originally introduced to the United States to manage uh, gypsy moth caterpillars uh, through their eggs, gypsy moths through their eggs. Um, and we found that will also prey on spotted lantern flies. 
Uh, so we have another one in the works. Okay. The researchers at Cornell happened to find in a park down in Berks County, a nat naturally occurring pathogen, a fungal pathogen. They found a fungus that attacks spotted lantern flies and kills it. Uh, the cool thing is one of the kinds that they found is Bavaria bassiana, and that actually is uh, an existing fungal insecticide that is currently in uh, production for managing agricultural insects, pests. Um, the other one that they found, the other fungus they found is Bacoa major. Uh, there isn't much known about that particular pathogen, except that it is really hard to manage in the, in the laboratory settings. But Bavaria does work, and they've done some studies with that uh, down in an area called Blue Marsh Lake in 2019. They did some applications to woodlots in the, uh, twice in the summer. Uh, they found out that the J July applications did reduce the nymph population by almost half. And in, when they applied it again in August, it was much less successful. They uh, not exactly repeated the experiment in 2020, but similarly, and the results were not nearly as promising then. Again, this is a new insect uh, to us it's a new insect to our land, to our plants, to the habitats that we have, and it's going to take us a while to learn how to manage it. So one other method of managing spotted lanternfly is quarantine. And I've mentioned it before, but what does quarantine mean? It's not complicated. It's just that no one may intentionally move viable life stages of spotted lanternflies. Uh, that includes egg masses. Uh, we're pretty sure that's how the uh, insect was introduced to Pennsylvania. And that's also how it was introduced down in Virginia from another shipment, we think from rocks. Uh, it took probably another five years to find the population down in Virginia and they were even looking for it down there, but they finally found it. But from different pictures I've shown you, all of these things, anything that's outdoors can be a really easy way to relocate the spotted lantern flies, especially as egg masses, but insects are really good at holding on to all sorts of surfaces so you can get the hitchhikers without planning to. Uh, businesses, not individuals, but businesses need permits to move within and out of the quarantine zone. We offer, we Penn State Extension offers the permit test. It is the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture that actually issues the permits. Okay. They used to issue hang tags. They don't issue hang tags any longer, but uh, within the information about the permitting, uh, you need to keep a log book and you need to teach your business people how to inspect the vehicles and when to do it and keep it in the log book. Okay. We make checklists for residents. So the residents can just be reminded what to look for when they're moving things, uh, when they're going camping, when they're visiting relatives, uh, whatever they're doing, okay? Stop the spread. And the bottom line is look before you leave, okay? Inspect your vehicles before you relocate them. Now, if you see spotted lantern fly, please report it using our online tool. Our Pennsylvania State Extension website will help you report it. Okay. And it'll take you to a map. All you need to do is put in your location and there'll be a couple more things asked. 
and it's real easy to do. There is a phone number, which on this year is only staffed Monday through Friday during normal business hours. I really encourage people to enter it online. Now we have a huge crew of researchers, all different groups, different groups within the United States Department of Agriculture, all the local universities are studying it. Uh, you can go to Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's website and see all the research that's been going on. Uh, if it's completed, if it's completed, you can download the report itself. It'll even tell you who the primary researchers are. But the bottom line is report spotted lanternfly sightings, destroy any stages that you find, whether it's eggs or nymphs or adults, scrape off the eggs and get rid of the eggs. Don't just let them fall on the ground, squish all the other stages, okay? and share your information with others, okay? So we've talked about all of these different aspects of spotted lanternfly. Please remember, don't panic, okay? Spotted lanternflies don't bite or sting. They don't eat structures. They don't nest in your house. And they don't carry any human pathogens. They are significantly inconvenient, I will admit that, just as there is life after these pretty caterpillars, there will be life after a spotted lanternfly. Extension.psu.edu, or just put Penn State spotted lanternfly into your favorite search engine, and you will end up at Extension's website. You can put your favorite terms right into the search bar or just right, just keep it simple, sweetie, right across the top in this blue band. Just click on the blue band and it'll take you directly to the spotted lanternfly section and just scroll down and see all the many different resources that are categorized there for you. But wait, wait, there's more. If you were wondering what was going on with the periodical cicadas, there's a webinar recorded on Conservation District's website from May. The master gardeners are having basic training classes. Uh, it starts in October, goes through the end of March. Uh, we encourage you to either watch a webinar on August 19th or have an in-person meeting on August 26th to learn details about master gardener program and training. If you want to, you can just email me and I'll get the information to you. The Master Gardeners of Columbia County are having our annual Fall into Gardening event. It will be a webinar, a live webinar, this fall on Saturday morning, September 18th. We have a presentation on how to create your own backyard bird habitat. Uh, there's an expert from Penn State who will be speaking about growing mushrooms at home. And I'll be back again to talk about spotted lanternfly and the update. The whole morning is only $15. We do offer an early bird discount. And there are really only two types of people in the world. Those who love bugs and those who don't yet know that they love bugs. I'm glad you could join us tonight. I'm Mary Jo Gibson. And are there any questions? All right, Mary Jo, it doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat box. You did answer the one question that was in there, which was what are the natural predators of uh, the spotted lantern lanternfly in their native land? Okay. What we have found, and this is getting more interesting because when we first learned about spotted lanternfly here, it looked like the birds weren't eating them. And whenever we saw a bird that was eating a spotted lanternfly, the question was, is it distasteful? Would they eat a second one? And now it's turning out that 
are native birds really are starting to feed on spotted lanternflies and apparently they're really tasty for chickens. So we're learning more and more about natural predators and it seems like some of our birds do eat them more than once. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in the chat box at the moment. Okay, well, thanks for having me, Brittany, and good night, everybody.